All right, guys. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna make this channel one of the great channels, or one of the great basketball channels on YouTube. All right. Um, I went ahead and bit the bullet. I uh, created a Facebook page. I created a Twitter page. All right. My Twitter page is uh, Come Fly with Mike, and I made a Facebook page. My name. Um, it's pretty easy, easy to find. I put a link to both in the description box. I've been doing that the last couple of videos, but it's the first time I'm saying it. So um, I'm going to try to make this channel as big as possible. All right. Um, I don't think that. I think one of my motivations for making these videos is people feel like you can't talk historical. Or, you know, you go, oh, it's boring talking about this and that. No, you have to have the passion behind it. And I don't think, you, I don't like the fact that there's so little content on television now where people talk about the history of the NBA. And people make these blanket comments and they have so much power and you don't realize how much they mislead or misinform people. And, um, this video today that I'm doing is inspired by a sub of mine. I think he's a sub of mine. I don't know whether he has subscribed to my channel or not. Um, I hope he has. His name is Raymond Parks. And he told me to talk about this thing that Colin Kyle was talking about where he says that LeBron James will statistically dominate uh, and crush Michael Jordan. Everything's all said and done. And... Um, this is my take on this. Well, LeBron James has a head start on Michael. LeBron James came right out of high school at 18 years old. Michael Jordan came out one year premature from college. He was 21 years old. Ended up getting his degree uh, from North Carolina, University of North Carolina, 86, I think it was. Um, so LeBron James will always have a little bit of a head start statistically over my, uh, Michael, especially if you look at accumulative numbers and not per game. Uh, numbers um, but th this is some, some of the things that Colin Cowher said that, to me just slant this they just smell of ignorance um, one thing I don't like about him first off is he uses statistics when it suits him he brings up numbers to bolster his argument about LeBron over Michael but when people bring up Russell Westbrook's numbers, he'll say, well, the numbers don't tell the whole story. Well, Russell Westbrook's averaging a triple-double. But then he'll say, well, yeah, but he's not playing defense. and He's only averaging double-digit rebounds because he's not. Well, you know, that in itself is another video. But let's talk about what he said. He said that LeBron James is... Bigger than Michael Jordan, no brainer. He's six eight two two sixty, I guess. Michael, I'm not including his Wizards years, but with the Bulls, Michael was uh, six five, listed six six, and between 189 to 216 pounds. He said he's stronger than Michael. Well, you would expect a small forward of his size to be stronger than Michael. But that's debatable, and I'm going to tell you why. If you're talking about prime Michael Jordan, well, not even prime Michael Jordan, you're talking about pre-retirement Jordan, 84 to 93, yeah, I, I'll, I'll say that. But if you're talking about the Michael Jordan that came out of retirement and played from 95 to 98 when he was between two, about 216 pounds, then I'm not so certain about that. And I'll tell you why. Because... There are certain moments where I would watch Michael and I would be absolutely amazed at how he was able to get his shot off over stronger defenders and power up power up shots that you wouldn't expect a man of his size to be able to do. Uh, Robert Ory uh, said in an interview that he was surprised at how strong Michael Jordan was. He bumped into him. Robert Ory was a guy who, uh, what was Robert Ory about? Six nine two forty, 
and he bumped into Michael and he was like, it was like running into a wall. It was like, damn, like, you know, Michael had a lot of what you would call core strength. And that's what he strengthened over the years. He had a lot of what you would call contact strength. You know, he might not be able to beat Andre the Giant or Will Chamberlain in arm wrestling, or, or he might even be able to beat LeBron James in arm wrestling. But he had such core physical strength when he was able to drive the times that he did drive the basket. That's why he would, be, you know, you would see video footage of him burling over the Davis boys or powering up and muscling a shot over Charles Oakley or muscling up shots over Anthony Mason, Mason who was one of the strongest guys in the NBA at the time. Uh, this is, you know, why you'll see him able be able to muscle up shots over Charles Barkley. You get what I'm saying? He had physical strength that he lacked uh, during the 80s when he played against the uh, Boston Celtics and especially the Detroit Pistons. The Pistons were the team that uh, motivated Michael to get physically stronger. So the strength argument, I think, is debatable. Uh, a better passer. Well, Michael Jordan was a shooting guard. LeBron James is a point forward. Statistically, he's a better passer. The numbers say that. He's going to finish with more assists. Uh, but that's not to say Michael Jordan wasn't a great passer. You remember uh, Michael Jordan's playground and uh, NBA player at the time who was with the Portland Trailblazers, uh, Buck Williams was talking about, you know, a lot of people, this was made in 1991, he said a lot of people talk about Larry Bird's passing ability and a lot of people talk about Magic Johnson's passing ability, but it's very few people that recognize the exceptional passer that Michael Jordan was, and that's very true. Uh, Michael Jordan for his career averaged about 5.3 assists per game, I think it was. But uh, he had seasons where he averaged well over six assists per game. And um, if Michael Jordan chose to, there were some games where he was an awe-inspiring passer. It's just that most people, when they look at Michael Jordan videos on YouTube, let's be honest, when most of us look up YouTube, footage of Michael from YouTube, we want to see him slam dunk over people, we want to see his beautiful bi balletic moves, we want to see him score 45 and 50 points against, you know, the, 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 you know, the Pacers and the Celtics, all these different teams, but we don't want to look at, we, we rarely do we ever look at highlights of Michael passing the basketball, but he was an exceptional passer, so once again, I think LeBron might be a, a better passer, but it's not as big an art, big a, a, a gap as he wants to as far as Colin Cowboy is concerned, make it out to be. I noticed he didn't bring up defense. Michael Jordan, now LeBron James, when he wants to be, is a very good defender. And there were times in, his, in the NBA where I thought he was a top 10 defen defensive player. But Michael Jordan has a Defensive Player of the Year award. Okay, Michael Jordan, oh man, there, there were years when you can make the argument he was the best offensive and defensive player in the league. Michael Jordan's probably a top two or three defensive perimeter player of all time. But you didn't bring that up, did you, Mr. Colin Coward? Uh, so, you know, there are certain things that you said that don't make sense. Um, what else did he say? What else did he say? He talked about how when well, Michael Jordan retired, the Bulls only went from 57 to 55. Uh, they only dropped two wins, whereas when LeBron James left Cleveland, they dropped from 61 to 19 wins. And this proves that LeBron James is just a more impactful player than Michael. Now, I did a video about this some years ago about why the Bulls only dropped two wins. And I'll put a description. I'll put a a link to in, the, in the description box about why that is the case about the Bulls. But basically, I'll say this, and I won't go into too much detail. Number one, that awesome coaching staff that the Bulls had. Phil Jackson, who should have won Coach of the Year in 1994. He should have won that award. 95-96 was great. The Bulls won 70. But in my opinion, Phil Jackson did his best coaching performance in 1994. And he, of course, he had, along with him, Jim Clemens and Tex winners, and I believe Johnny Bach was still there. I mean, as an assistant coach. Uh, awesome coaching staff. Um, Scottie Pippen probably should have won 
defensive player. Uh, excuse me, not defensive. Well, he, he could have won defensive player of the year that year. Well, uh, but he probably should have won MVP. If you look at the true meaning of MVP, I don't have a problem with Kim Olajuwon winning it that year, but Scottie Pippen was intrigual, intrigual for that team to win 55 ball games. Okay, not only was Scottie Pippen's play absurd that year, I think it was his best overall year. Now, definitely 93, 94, 94, 95 were his best overall seasons. Not only that, Horace Grant, for the first and only time in his career, was an all-star, helping to make up for the lack of Michael Jordan being on the team. Not only that, but B.J. Armstrong was an all-star that year for the first and only time in his career, averaging something like 14 points. And uh, how many assists did he, did he average that year? Eight? I think something like that. Over 14 points and eight assists per game. B. John Strong was phenomenal that year, okay? Um, Pete Myers. Pete Myers was not a great basketball player, but he was a very good defensive player, and he was a big guard. That's what Phil Jackson wanted. Uh, he knew he wasn't going to get the 30 points per game from Pete Myers, so what he did was the Bulls changed the way they played. Um the first couple of championship years, the Bulls averaged 110 points per game. And 93, that drop, I think they dropped to something like uh, 103 points per game or something like that. Uh, the, the year that uh, Jordan didn't play, the Bulls' offense dropped from 103 to 96. They dropped something like seven points per game, which is huge on a per-game average. Uh, but their defense considerably improved they focused more on defense and they won in my opinion even though they won 55 games they probably won 10 games off of sheer luck and or just their defensive effort there were many games that the bulls they probably should have lost but their defense held true um uh, and um whereas you go to cleveland right Yes, on the surface, they dropped from 61 wins to 19 wins. But let's be honest. Yes, the loss of LeBron James was huge. But let's also take some other things into consideration. Mike Brown, the reigning head coach of the year, was fired. I think it's the only time that a, that a reigning head coach of the year, NBA head coach of the year, was fired during the offseason. Not only was he fired, his coaching staff was gone. Uh, so Jonas Ilgowskis, who was the center for the Cleveland Cavaliers for a decade and a half left with Miami, uh, left with LeBron James to go to Miami, okay? Mo Williams was injured for a good portion of the year, as well as, if I'm not mistaken, Anderson, Anderson, uh, Anderson Verjao, okay? And I think some other players that were injured. You take all of this chaos, is there any reason not to be uh, surprised that they only won 19 games? Also, let me t say this too. Did Michael Jordan ever play with a point guard as skilled as Kyrie Irving? Has he ever played with a power forward as dynamic as Kevin Love? Now, Dennis Rodman was tr tremendous, you know what I'm saying? I think Dennis Rodman in his prime was the best defensive player in the league, possibly. I think he's the greatest rebounder of all time. But offensively, he's myopic, okay? He does not give you much on offense. Uh... Dennis would give you between two to five points per game. If you got double digits from points and, and Dennis, you had a pretty damn good game from him, okay? Kevin Love, people forget, when he was with the Minnesota Timberwolves, was a 26-14 and 14 guy one year. I think it was a 26-15 and 15 guy one year. Had a 30-30 game. The first NBA player since Moses Malone to score 30 points and grab 30 rebounds in the same game. These are his teammates in Cleveland, and yet LeBron clamors for more help, as does his fanboys, who unfortunately Colin Coward, Colin Cowherd is one of them. Okay. Then he said Michael Jordan could never beat the Celtics, and the Pistons until they got old. Well, 
the Pistons, when they were beating Michael, 86-87, weren't they beating everybody else? In 86, they beat everybody else to win the title. In 87, they beat everybody except for the Lakers, losing them in the finals in six games. They were beating everybody. So poor Michael should be ashamed for losing to the NBA champion Celtics and then the Eastern Conference champions and defending champion Celtics in 87. Oh, yeah, at the eighth seed, he should really be ashamed of that. That's ridiculous. And I'm tired and sick and tired of hearing people say that the Pistons lost to Celt- uh, lost to Michael when they got old. They did not get old. The Bulls overtook them. Got to remember in 90, in 90, when they repeated as champions, the Bulls took them to seven games that year. The Bulls were getting better and better. Every year, the Bulls overtook the Pistons in 91. Because I contend to anybody, even if the Pistons didn't have the injury issues they had in 91, the Bulls would have beaten them anyway. And and since when has been between being 28 and 30 years old, which was the average age of that roster? Because Joe Dumars was in his late 20s. Isaiah Thomas was about 30. He was 30 years old. That's old now. But yet, those Bulls teams in the late 90s, Michael was 35 years old that last championship year. Pippen was 33. Robin was 37. But no one calls them old. Why were they these old men? You know, there's something to be said, too, about this age thing. You guys ever noticed that in the late 90s, the old men were running the league? You had Michael Jordan, 35, Pippen, 32, going on 33, Robin, 37 with the Bulls, right? Then you had Utah, Carl Malone and John Stockton. Carl Malone was 34. John Stockton was 35. They're winning 62 games in the league. Look at Houston, okay? Uh, Charles Barkley, Akeem Olajuwon, and Clyde Drexler in 97. They won 57 ball games, all right? The year that they weren't so banged up. They were all like 33, 34 years old. Why were the old men in the league beating everybody else's butt? But the Pistons get a pass because, oh, they were old. They were old. They were only 27, 28 years old. They were long in the tooth. They're old. It's a lot of malarkey. It's excuses. And then another thing that he said was that Michael Jordan lost for eight years, and then all of a sudden he got Scottie Pippen and he started winning, which is not accurate at all. Okay. Michael lost the first six years of his career. But he got Scottie Pippen his third year, his fourth year, excuse me. His fourth year. You know what Pippen averages rookie year? I think something like seven points a game. While Michael averaged 35. I don't think that it was Scottie Pippen that made Michael Jordan start winning by himself. Because people forget that he also got Horace Grant. Now, of course, Scottie Pippen was essential to those title teams. Because I don't think there's really any superstar to win a title by himself. People love to say Akeem Olajuwon did, and he did not. Okay, Olajuwon stands. He did not win a title by himself. Okay, neither one of those years. He had Otis Thorpe there. Okay, he had help. He had Kenny Smith. He had Sam Cassell. He had Robert Ory. He had players there. Okay. I get tired of those guys that keep saying that he Kim Lajuan did everything by himself. He did not. Clyde Drexler averaged something like in the ninety five finals, he averaged something like twenty one points, nine rebounds, seven assists, and two steals. Are you kidding me? Robert Ory averaged seventeen points and ten rebounds and three blocks per game against Shaq. Stop saying Akeem Olajuwon did everything by himself because you're making yourself sound like a fanboy. Yes, Akeem Olajuwon is the only 
Uh, and that's actually that's not essentially true either because I, I see people say, "Well, Kim Lajuan is the only player to win a championship not playing with another All Star," but that's not true because Michael Jordan played won a title ninety one. Pippen was an All Star in ninety one. Nor was he an All Star in ninety eight. But that's conveniently forgotten. Oh, but 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 if it wasn't for this, but 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 but, but Pippen was but Pippen was an All Star. Well, Clyde Drexler was a superstar. But you guys will say, oh, but he was longer too. But anyway, that's another argument. I'll end this video on this. Colin Coward could never defeat me in an argument, an intelligent argument about these two players' legacies. He couldn't. And he wants to say that, well, Michael Jordan made a movie. LeBron James is going to be making sitcoms and, and, and series and... Look, LeBron James' popularity will never eclipse Michael's. It just won't, just because of the age that we live in. The only athlete more popular than Michael Jordan in history was Muhammad Ali. That's it. No athlete was as beloved as Michael Jordan. No athlete was as respected as Michael Jordan, other than Ali. LeBron James is not as beloved and he's not as respected. And it has nothing to do with Michael Jordan, uh, you know, rithering around on his throne, thinking that uh, LeBron James is going to overtake him. It has nothing to do with that. It's because LeBron James' his own doing, his own doing, that Watergate on his legacy, which was when he left Cleveland to go to Miami, that's a stain. He had to team up, you know, because in reality, he could not beat the Celtics. The Celtics ran LeBron James out of Cleveland to go team up with a couple of superstars. And then what did LeBron James do still that first year? Have a historically awful performance in the finals. Against a team he should have beaten, the Mavericks. Then he plays a green team, a very green Oklahoma City Thunder team. Then he beats, well, really Ray Allen did, but then he beats a Spurs team that was pretty good. But then with Kawhi Leonard finally coming to his own, then he loses in the finals that he probably should have won against the Spurs. And then he sees that Dwayne Wade and company are getting a little older, especially Wade. Wade's no longer in that superstar status. And then he sees what's going on with Cleveland, and then he goes back to Cleveland. LeBron James needs help in all categories whatsoever. All, all of, he, he, I've never seen a superstar who needs so much help as far as his team's concerned. Now, did Michael Jordan ever defeat a 73-9 team in the finals? Come back from three games to one deficit? No. No. He never, he's never done that. I'll give him that. I'll give LeBron James that. But Michael Jordan's never actually been in a deficit in the finals outside of twice being down one game to nothing against the Utah Jazz and Lakers. When Michael Jordan was in the finals, it was all business, and usually he destroyed his opposition, especially when he was in his prime. The most memorable moments for Michael Jordan are not regular season and often not even the playoffs. It's in the finals. The highest stage that we can think of, Michael Jordan almost always Stepped up. Every finals, we can think of a moment. The 91, the switch, the, the reverse, you know, switch switch of hands from the, the dunk with Sam Perkins in the way and the, the, you know, the move. 92, it was the shrug. 93, it was, I, I remember the 55-point game against the Phoenix Suns. But even the last play for the Bulls, 
when Scottie Pippen found John Pax on the perimeter, it was Michael Jordan who was bringing the ball up and started that sequence. In 96, it was Jordan jawing at Gary Payton. You know, Payton did a hell of a job on Jordan in that series. But then I think of Michael embracing the basketball on Father's Day. His first championship since losing his father. In 97, I think of the flu game. In 90, I think of the shot over Russell, the greatest moment and one of the greatest sequences in basketball history. His layup, steal, of, steal from behind from Carl Malone, and snatching victory away from Utah Jazz single-handedly. That's what champions do. That's why Michael Jordan's beloved. And that's why LeBron James will never touch that. He won't. He just won't. He might become the second greatest or third greatest basketball player of all time, but he will not tug on Superman's cape, and it kills you, and you know it. And while LeBron James has had one hell of a run um, with all these final appearances, more final appearances than Michael, it's amazing. But let's not kid ourselves. LeBron James, ever since Garnett, Allen, and Pierce got old with Boston, right? Until this year. This is the weakest I have ever seen the Eastern Conference in my entire life as far as watching basketball, NBA basketball, and that's nearly 30 years. 27 years of watching it. I have never seen it this week. Even when Michael Jordan played, and yes, you could say the overall talent level the NBA had dropped from the 80s, but it was still better than what it is now. Case in point. In the 91 Eastern Conference Finals, the Bulls played against the Detroit Pistons. In 92, they played against uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers, who were a very good team at that particular time. In 93, they played against the New York Knicks. In 96, the, the New York Knicks, who won 60 games, which was a franchise record, tying the championship Knicks of the early 70s. In 97, excuse me, 96, they played against the Orlando Magic, who won 60 games, who had Penny and Shaq and Horace Grant and Dennis Scott and Nick Anderson, all right? The team that probably should have beaten the Houston Rockets in 95 had they not mentally choked. All right. In 97, they played against a 61 win Miami Heat team with Alonzo Mourning and Kurt Thomas and Tim Hardaway and Dan Marley. And it was a loaded, great defensive team with one of the best head coaches of all time, Pat Riley. That was a great, great team. And in 98, they were taken to the limit. By the 58 win Indiana Pacers. I know Kim and Trill think that team is not that good. You know, but uh, as good as I'm saying they are. But Kim and Trill knows his basketball, man. I'm, 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 I've been humbled by him, man. He, I underestimated him, but he knows his stuff. But the point is, the Cavaliers play nothing like that. And this is the first year that they have any competition any competition needs a confidence he's already whining and, and complaining. LeBron. So, I think I made my case. Tell me what you guys think.